I just want to start by asking those amongst us to raise your hand if you enjoyed maths at school. Yeah, okay. Well, that's 50-50 and that's pretty much what I expected. It's kind of one of those things, really. Uh, maths is a bit of a polarising subject at school. People either love it or they hate it. And uh, it's not like history or English where, yeah, you can take it or leave it. Maths is either one or the other, it seems. And I, I enjoyed maths at school. Um, I, I did enjoy it. Um, <coughs> and yeah, I think uh, maths can teach us a lot of good things. I want to just have a, take a moment to have a look at Isaac Newton. <coughs> Isaac Newton uh, was a, an amazing mathematician. You probably have heard some of the stories about him in the way that he discovered some things that <coughs> uh, are the, the, the foundation for a lot of our mathematics and, and um, physics. You probably have heard the story about him sitting under the apple tree, minding his own business, and all of a sudden this apple drops and dongs him on the head and um, falls to the ground. And you and I would kind of just probably, I don't know, pick up the apple and eat it or wander off and do something else. But instead of just eating the apple and walking off, he comes up with this, right? Uh, as you would on a casual day out in the field <laughs> under an apple tree. Uh, that's the sort of thing that uh, this guy kind of thought about when an apple drops on his head. Uh, a bit of an exception. <coughs> He's also contributed to a lot of things uh, in, in the theory we have for light. He, he devised this initial thing called the, the, light, the particle theory of light. We've got uh, Einstein. Uh, so this guy was around in the 1600s. Einstein was only around... 50 years ago, and he brought out quantum theory, which changed a lot of the fundamental things that um, Newton had put in place. But even still, even with quantum theory, we still can't fully explain some of these things other than with the theories that Newton put in place back in the 1600s. Very clever guy. <coughs> uh, in fact, Newton was uh, the father of what we call um, mathematics and calculus and algebra. And um, he was the father of that formula you can see there. No one had thought about putting uh, numbers in the terms of letters like that before and being able to mathematically quantify things and, and work them out. <coughs> he contributed to uh, the, the fundamental laws of motion, three laws that we have. Force equals mass times acceleration. You probably have heard of this one before. The angle of incidence will always equal the angle of, angle of reflection of an object hitting another one. Assuming that that the object it's hitting is still. These principles are the underlying um, foundation of all of the physics that's mechanics that's taken place in our thumping big textbooks that we look at when we study physics ever since. So this guy obviously had a good brain in his head and wasn't afraid to use it. Interesting story though, he was a failure at school and left school at 14 years of age and went and had to help his mum in their farm because he just wasn't cutting it in school. Um, the details are not clear to me. I, I probably could research it more, but it turns out he ended up at Trinity Grammar in uh, Trinity College in, in Cambridge, somewhere down the track after leaving school at 14. And all of these earth-shattering, groundbreaking discoveries that you see on the board there occurred within one year of this guy uh, graduating from Trinity College. Pretty amazing. He basically changed the whole world of mathematics and physics in the space of a year and he failed school, which is pretty cool. Uh, there's, a, there's a lecturer at Avondale College who uh, did his PhD in the study of the meniscus of water. The meniscus is that little arc of water that you see at the top of something in a test tube or even in bigger bodies uh, where the, um, the surface tension of the water hugs the side of a, a vessel and, has, and forms that nice smooth curve that, you know, that we know of as the meniscus. Interestingly, you can see in this picture here that mercury has a, a, a dome-shaped meniscus, whereas water has a, a concave-shaped meniscus. Well, there are, uh, as you can imagine, a lot of mathematical uh, things to consider when you look at the curve of a meniscus. And that depends on the size of the, of the, the circle of the, the vessel that the water is in, the temperature of the water, 
the consistency and, and the viscosity of the water and various things. And, and maths has allowed us to quantify those things such that we can predict the curve that water will make in various vessels. Some of you might have seen um, the uh, movie Hidden Figures. I saw it on a plane a little while ago. It's a very interesting movie. If you haven't seen it, I'd recommend it. It's a really, really good one and possibly even a good one for, for young, young kids to watch. Maybe not children my age, but my kids' age, but certainly young adults would get a great kick out of it. It's a story of the, uh, the, the, the struggles that they had to get man on the moon <coughs> back in the 60s. So at NASA, they, they didn't have calculators or computers uh, in, that, in that era in the way that we do now. And a lot of the maths that they had to do to calculate, uh, to, to get stuff organised for the, the moon um, venture, they had to do by hand. And there were these three uh, Negro American women who uh, were kind of had to be on a room off to the side because they were not male and they were Negro. And they had to use separate toilets as well to the, to the, to the males and, and the other white females in the, in the NASA plant. But these guys uh, were actually, in the end, the guys that got man to the moon. The main mathematical team at NASA was struggling to come up with some way. The, 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 the trouble was they could get man to the moon very easily. Uh, it was just basically strap into a rocket and launch the thing and it would land on the moon pretty much. That was pretty rudimentary. Uh, it might sound strange to say that, but it, the hard part was getting him back alive and knowing where on Earth, literally, um, he was going to land uh, because Earth's a big place and it's spinning and these things have interesting trajectories. And they were struggling mathematically to determine how and where and when this, this um, lunar landing would come back and land on Earth. And it was these one woman in particular who came up with the uh, mathematical solution to this problem and she called on Euler's theory. Uh, Euler was um, another one of these guys with long curly hair. To put it simply, uh, it, his theory looks at the way that as, a vessel, as, as this vessel was going to pass across the earth and get closer to the earth, the force that was going to act on it was going to get greater in a progressively large way. Combined with the aerodynamics of the, of the thing and, and the, the turn of the earth, Pretty simply, uh, they were able to use that formula in a very elementary way to calculate uh, to an alarmingly precise level where this, this thing was going to land in the middle of the ocean and these guys were hopefully going to be saved without drowning uh, or being stranded in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean or wherever it was they landed. Anyway, all of this maths is kind of just to sort of say that it's interesting how we have tried to grapple with our world and try and put a handle on it. And maths has allowed us to do that to some extent. Uh, we can quantify things, we can predict things, we can manage things a lot uh, through the use of mathematics and our, and our brain at trying to get a handle on all of the physical principles that are around us and quantifying them and, and working through them in, in, in a, towards a solution that can usually uh, work out very well. <coughs> And as time's gone on, on over the centuries, we've got better and better at doing that. We are much more clever at doing certain things than we were even 10, 20 years ago. You look at computers and how they've changed in the space of 20 years or 30 years. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's staggering the rate at which we are getting better at, at, at getting a handle on this stuff. You know, we, we've, got, we've got man to the moon, which is a pretty, pretty special thing, really, uh, as far as we're concerned. And in some ways, I think um, we can be a little bit vulnerable to believing that we've almost outsmarted God um, in some ways. You might kind of from a distance scoff at that and go, oh yeah, how could we outsmart God? But really often I think we tend to feel that we have. I know I certainly do. <coughs> think about evolution, for example, another example. So, you know, the Bible points out that we were created in a week through, through the creation week. And um, man's kind of stood there and thought, well, hang on a second, what about this, this and this, monkeys going to such to Homo erectus, Homo sapiens, rah, rah, rah. 
I think we can work out a, a more logical, reasonable way, don't you? Uh, that this idea of God just clicking his fingers, I think we're smarter than God. We can, we, can, we can propose a theory that is much more plausible than some guy with a long robe and long hair um, breathing these people into existence. That's ridiculous, surely. It doesn't stop there. Our, our theory of, of being intelligent is, is uh, possibly even illustrated more by the fact that often the more we know, uh, the more education we have, the more knowledge we have, the more self-reliant we become and the more we feel like we've got what it takes to get through life. And I, I as a Christian, personally can, can un- feel that myself often. Now you think, oh, I need God. I, I do need God. I can think from a big picture, you know, I can read the Bible and yes, he died for my sins and all of that. But really as I walk out the door of the church every week, I kind of, yeah, I think I'll be right there this week, you know. Uh, most of the things that come my way, I'll be able to think my way through and I'm pretty quick on my feet and I can wrestle through most of the things that will come my way this week. I might call on God every now and then if I think of it, but mostly I won't. And I'm pretty good, you know. I, yeah, sure, I need God, but not much. I, I'm all right. You know, I can, I can get through this. And sometimes I think the more we know, the more the case that that is. I often, I, it often amazes me when I uh, have been a missionary's child or when I've done work for the Hollows Foundation in uh, overseas third, third world developing countries and you look at these places and you see how differently people see God and how differently they are open to him compared to our, our more um, sedentary, knowledgeable technological world where we feel very self-reliant, self-complacent and we don't really see that we need God that much because we're pretty comfortable without him. And um, it's a contrast that that is very evident as soon as you step out of a developed world into a developing world that that, um, that difference in mindset um, is still is is very palpable. (coughs) So we think we're pretty good at, um, at running our own show. And then every now and then something supernatural can happen in our life maybe that turns all of our logic and all of our formulas and all of our self-assurance on its head upside down. Gravity seems to work upwards instead of down. The, The things that we kind of thought we understood and we knew all of a sudden don't quite work the way we we thought they would. But we're all brought back to a humble reality that earth is just a little uh, speck in the universe and that while we think we may know a bit of stuff, there's a lot more stuff going on here that we really have no handle on at all. And uh, we get sometimes an occasional glimpse into um, God's kind of maths, which is a lot more um, elaborate and powerful and all-encompassing than ours and actually often is quite surprisingly different to ours. I want to just take a few moments um, to go over some examples in the Bible. I think the Bible is full of ways. In fact, if I can go as far as to say is the Bible is all about teaching us God's kind of maths and showing us how different God's kind of maths is to our kind of maths. And I want to give you some examples from the Bible that, that illustrate this. <coughs> Matthew chapter 20. Uh, we read this parable that Jesus gives about the the owner of a vineyard. It's harvest time, he's got lots of grapes on the vine and he's ready to have them picked. And so he puts a sign up and stands at his front gate for anyone who wants to come and help to pick his grapes for the day. And he gets a few people at nine in the morning and they start working hard in the hot sun. Morning tea time, a few more people show up, he grabs them and gets them in working. Lunch time, afternoon tea time, more people come in. And then it's nearly knock-off time, let's say it's 4.30 in the afternoon and uh, he's still at the gate, there's still grapes to be picked and so he, he sees someone else come past and he says, hey, come on, you want to help? Come and help me, I'll pay you uh, and I need my grapes, my grapes picked. So you know the story, you know the parable, come five o'clock, it's knock-off time, they all go to the front gate and said, right, we're ready to be paid. And the farmer gives them all equal pay for the day. And you can understand why some of them uh, were a little bit disgruntled with that. The guys that have been working in the hot sun all day since 9am 
not the same as the guy that had showed up at the end at 4.30. And it really just doesn't sit right with us, does it? You don't sort of hear that story and go, yeah, that seems fair. Uh, that's reasonable. It kind of contradicts all laws of fairness, all laws of human motivation and just compensation that we might think of. You know, it, it really challenges that. And really, you, you kind of think, this boss has got no idea. How is he going to get people to work for him for a full day the next day if he does this sort of thing when they're all going to show up at 4.30 and put their hand out for a full day's wage? This guy's got it all wrong. But it just illustrates once again how different um, God's way of thinking is. And obviously from a spiritual sense, we know that on the, the thief on the cross, you know, there, were, there were people all around that cross uh, when Jesus was crucified who'd been you know, godly followers all their life. And this guy on the cross who's a rat bag, the last half hour says, you know, I accept you. And he gets the gift of eternal life, which seems unfair that you can be doing all of those naughty things and having all that so-called fun. And then at the last minute he gets across the line. That doesn't seem fair, does it, to us? But God thinks about it really differently. His love for us is, is based on so many different things than what we think about when we think about the weight and the cost of, and the price of love. He looks at it so differently to us. <coughs> in Mark chapter 12, you've seen all of these Pharisees loaded with money, coming in very proudly and demonstratively putting their money in the, in the offering thing. And then this little old lady totters past on her last legs and all she puts is a single, lonely little five-cent coin in the, in the treasure chest. And um, Jesus says to his disciples at the time, have a look at this woman. She's given more than all of these other people uh, have. She's given everything she had. That was her last five cents. And, you know, we need to look at her and admire what she's given because she's actually given more than all of these other people. And you think about that for a moment and you think, well, gee, you know, I hope he said that softly because there were a lot of wealthy donors in that temple who would have been put right off by that comment. You know, that wasn't very, very thoughtful and, and maybe we can forgive him because back then the, the laws of fundraising and, and donor maintenance and, uh, you know, the inner circle of contributors, the personal letters, the fundraising banquets, the, the dip diplomacy that we have to use when we're encouraging people to give money, he was jeopardising all of that. The plans of, you know, that, that temple needed all of that money. And these people uh, were, were good donors. He was risking offence to them, wasn't he? I mean, that just seems so wrong. Why would he say that? Uh, surely he could acknowledge the, the hefty sums these people have put in. But no, God uh, looks at things differently. He, had a, he, he was looking at the motive behind what was given and the sacrifice of what was given. The actual money, the amount of money that these people were giving to him was irrelevant. It was completely irrelevant. What he, he, he had, God can give, or he can fund any church with the, the click of his fingers. It's not the money that God needs. It's the motivation and the heart. And we so often don't see that. <coughs> Another story in Luke chapter 15 uh, talks about Jesus with his sheep of, uh, flock of a hundred and he's lost one sheep and he takes off across the countryside to find this one lost sheep leaving, of course, the 99 behind. And he finds the sheep and he brings it back and you think, well, that's a lovely story, but hang on a second. There was 99 sheep he left behind there. You know, there's wolves, there's rustlers. Was that really a responsible thing to do? Would we really recommend that course of action? Uh, you know, that, that was a fairly reckless thing to do. Uh, how would he feel if he had to come back with that one lamb uh, that he'd found and had have lost, uh, you know, another 24 in the meantime, I mean, that just doesn't seem right. But the way God thinks and the way God demonstrates his love to us is very different and has very different parameters to what any of us can, can fathom. Another story, John chapter 12. Uh, you, you know the story well, I'm sure. Jesus, uh, Mary Magdalene obviously has been touched to the point where she's moved and spends a year's wages on a, on a bottle of perfume. She brings it in to Jesus, who's sitting in a room, pours it all over his feet and um, washes his feet with her hair. And obviously that's a cultural thing. Uh, washing of the feet was important back then. These guys walked around dusty roads with sandals on. That's, that's why part of our church culture has the foot washing pro, uh, process that we do. It's symbolic of what life was like back then when 
That was a real act of service to clean someone's feet. So she not only cleaned his feet and washed them, she did it with very expensive perfume, uh, a year's worth of wages. And sometimes I feel like I resonate with Judas and I say, well, who, as you may know in the story, Judas thought that was a bit excessive and a bit of a waste. Now, surely a few drops of perfume would have done the same thing. She could have washed them with water and then put a bit of perfume on, just a few drops to, to get the scent going and maybe that would have been enough, you know. Think of all the people that could have benefited from that money if it had been given to the poor or to the, to the church. And did Jesus really want perfume spilled all over his feet? I mean, you know, it's a bit, bit, bit reckless. Surely. But Jesus saw it very differently. He savoured that special moment and understood the expression that was coming from this woman who was a, a prostitute and who had been forgiven by Jesus in, in a way that had obviously touched her and moved her in her life in a, in a special way. For Jesus, it was not about the money that this lady had spent. It was about the expression of love that came. So <coughs> I'm going to give you a few more examples, just briefer ones. You know the story of Gideon in Judges chapter 6 and 7. Gideon uh, was called by God to lead Israel out of oppression from, I think it was the Midianites. God called him and he didn't really believe that, that he was up for it. But he thought God might have made a mistake. We know the story when he puts the fleece out and has the miracle performed and God says, yes Gideon, I'm for real, you are the man, I want you to do this job. So sure enough, after that, Gideon does embrace the task and sets off to find some men to go and take on uh, the enemy. And he has several thousand men. In fact, we know that from the story there were tens of thousands of men who were moved to the point where they would risk their lives and join Gideon in this fight to free the nation from the oppressive people. <coughs> and we know how the story goes. First, God says, you've got too many men, Gideon. You've got too many men. And Gideon says, well, what do you mean? There's, there's hundreds of thousands of these guys and I've only got tens of thousands of people. Surely we need every one of these blokes and more. God says, no, you've got too many men. They go to the river and he says, right, watch your men. Whoever um, kneels down and sucks water from the, from the river itself, keep them. If they are a little bit less game and sit up looking around for the enemy and, and drink the water from their hand, then they're, well, they're obviously not ready and send them home. Well, in fact, actually, more than that, before, before he even does that, he asks the guys, who's scared, who wants to go home? And all that's left is 10,000. Almost everyone goes home. And then he does the water trick and brings it down to a couple of thousand. And then he says, uh, no, actually, that brings it down to 300. Only 300 people out of an army of tens of thousands actually drank the water from the river mouth to water rather than scooping it up and keeping an eye on the enemy. So God says, that's all you need, 300. And we know the story. God performs a miracle um, for Gideon. And when Gideon thought he needed hundreds of thousands of men, God knew that all he needed was 300 men and some faith, and that would do the job. <coughs> oh, it's, an, it's an amazing story. David and Goliath. Here he is, the young fella, the whippersnapper. Who would have thought that a, a teenager could do that? And we know the story. The king offers him his armour, and David puts it on and goes, I can't fight in this. And he's brought down even to the point where he's not only the youngest guy in the whole army, and the weediest guy, he doesn't have any armour on, he doesn't have a shield, he doesn't have a gun, he doesn't have a spear, he doesn't have an arrow. All he's got is a little piece of leather with a rock in it. And it's enough to do the job because he believes in God and God's kind of maths takes over and man's kind of maths gets pushed aside and we see an incredible result. <coughs> Jesus asked us in the Bible when, when the disciples said, him, how, said to him, how often should we, how much forgiveness should we Give. If, if someone asks us to forgive them, should we forgive them? Yes. Well, how many times do we keep doing that before enough's enough? He said 70 times 7. In other words, just keep going. There's no time when it's not appropriate to forgive someone for what they've done. And uh, that's a pretty challenging number. You know, I guess you could take it literally 490 times so we can see the symbolism behind it. it. God is never okay with us stopping to forgive someone. And that's a challenging principle too. Feeding the 5,000 people. Here they were, 5,000 people on a mountainside, all hungry, looking for some food. What do you do? Well, you look for the kid who's got five loaves and two fishes and you feed a whole mass of people with just that amount. Uh, 
that's pretty special maths. I don't think anyone on that day would have believed that that was possible. And I think they would have been all uh, very blessed by the miracle that took place and the faith that was put forward by that young child and the act of service that that young child made. Faith as small as a mustard seed. It's the smallest seed known to man and it, and it grows a mustard tree, which you know, is obviously a substantial tree. Jesus said, if you have faith as small as that seed, you can move mountains. He also said, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. Once again, just a complete paradigm shift in the way that we think, just tipping our world upside down and everything we're striving for to be the biggest, the best, the fastest, the strongest. God says, no, that's not how we want this to work. Flip it around. The last will be first and the first will be last. <coughs> and I think if the final example is the gospel. The gospel itself is an enigma. How can you get your head around this idea of eternal life and salvation when we deserve it the very least? We get the greatest gift of all just by simply accepting Jesus. That just doesn't add up. It doesn't make sense to us. We feel like there must be something we have to do to earn this. There must be something we have to pay in penance to achieve this incredibly wonderful gift. But there's not. And ironically, the less we do, the more we rely on Jesus, the more entitled we are to have that gift. The Bible's kind of like, if, you might, if I might use a, a, a non-biblical example, it's like, like a jewellery shop where this, this guy might break in one night and just take all the prices off everything and swap them around. So that all of a sudden, the, the $100,000 diamond necklace is worth as much as the, the cheap... Um, metallic ring for $20. All of the things that we hold dear and that we value in terms of our pride and our self-worth are challenged in a really different way and the, and the Bible does that in, in so many different places. It's, it's, uh, it really, you can't read the Bible and not have your world uh, challenged and changed and, and in some way tipped upside down. <coughs> I just want to close by um, going through what I think is one of the most amazing passages in the Bible. It's in Ephesians chapter 3, and we read some of it um, uh, with Adam this morning in the scripture reading. It starts out, uh, as Adam read, it says, I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And, uh, and this, I wanted to start dissecting this first part of this passage a little bit. We have access to the Holy Spirit and that is an amazing thing. The Holy Spirit can empower us in ways that we don't have the capacity to, to, to function ourselves. We have an opportunity for God to dwell in our hearts and to empower us as Christians in a very special way. Imagine if as Christians, as a church and as individuals, uh, we let Christ dwell in our hearts and had true faith in him, like some of these examples that we read uh, that, I've, that I've gone through from the Bible. Imagine if we had Jesus in our life, if Christ dwelt in our hearts in that way, what, what a difference it would make in the potency we could have as individuals and as a church. <coughs> uh, it's, it's a sobering thought. The passage goes on and it says, And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all God's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know that this love and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of the, the, all the fullness of God's love of, of all the fullness of God that's a pretty pretty uh, it's I, I often have I, you have to read that passage uh, several times to really understand what it's saying and, and possibly I still don't but it does it, it, it brings out the first part of this, there's another passage that's part of this passage that's coming that also um, illustrates how poorly we understand God. This first, this first part here says we really don't understand God's love. We really don't have a handle on how much he loves us. But he can help us to understand that. And as a church, it, it, it says, and I pray that you, together with all the Lord's holy people, and I pray that we as a church, might be able to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. 
if we can really understand how much God loves us and what he's done for us, it will change our lives in a very profound way, I'm sure of that. It will really tip our world upside down. If we can understand what God has done for us, even though we don't deserve it, and how much he loves us, even though we don't deserve it, there is no way you can fully comprehend that and not be changed. And, it, and, and there is no way that in that change you can't be uh, empowered as a Christian in, in ways that will fulfil God's calling for what we're meant to do as disciples and followers of him. <coughs> so we can't comprehend God's love and we need him to help us understand it. The other part of that, that, that passage there is that really God, we, we have the opportunity to know God as a friend, as a creator, and uh, not just as a, as a God figure up on a cloud in heaven, but someone that we can know personally and, and talk with and understand. I don't know if any of you have ever met the Queen. I suspect the, ch the chances are, are very low that anyone's ever had a chat with the Queen and shaken her hand. And I'm sure if we were in a position where we were going to be meeting the Queen, we'd feel rather intimidated and, and we'd find it a little bit daunting. I have never met the Queen, but I have, uh, when I was a, a medical student, I was working at Sydney Children's Hospital. And... The Queen was on tour in Australia from England and it was announced uh, that in three days' time the Queen would be at the hospital. And, um, mate, you have no idea what brass was polished, what, what floors were swept, what windows were cleaned. You've got no idea what, in it, what went on in that hospital in the next three days. And it was incredible. And um, these people were, were really revved up for this Queen arrival, right? So... Sure enough, she comes in and she's in the, in the foyer area and it's a packed house. There's, there's patients, there's staff, there's visitors, there's media, there's everyone everywhere. It was, a, it was a mess. But everyone was really pumped to meet the Queen and very few people actually got to shake her hand or even you know, give, her, give, her a, give her a nod or get the royal wave from her. But uh, people were there and happy to just be there, even near her, to see her. Uh, and they had prepared themselves for days and it was a, the place was in a, in a frenzy over it. And we have the opportunity as Christians to have the king of the universe on the phone in prayer every week, every day, every minute if we want it. And what an amazing thing. What an amazing thing. We have the God of all, the all-powerful God of the universe ready to help us out, to help us through the challenges that come our way, the conversations that we have each day, the difficulties we have with colleagues or staff or um, the boss or the government, he's right there ready to help us, to build a relationship with us and to demonstrate his love to us, in us and through us. And that is uh, a real privilege. <coughs> I wanted to get to know God to the point where I'm fearless in what he can do through me. I want to get to know God to the point where he can teach me what can be done, not what can't be done. I want a relationship with God like David had. God says in the Bible he was a man after his own heart. Or Elijah. You know, Elijah had such a relationship with God. We read about it in the, in the Bible. He did some amazing things. And in the end, God just sent a chariot and took him to heaven. He said, you know, this guy is close enough to me that he's ready to come up and be with me now. And he lived his life completely devoted to uh, serving God and getting to know God. And that's what I want in my life, and maybe you do too. <coughs> the last part of this passage is, is probably the best. It says, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Well, that's the kind of maths I want in my life, right there. The God who can do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. Wow, what a promise that is. In fact, all we have to do is accept him and say, yeah, God, let's go, and it's on. If we continue to keep our hearts open to God and we do that through studying the Bible and through prayer and, and continue to build our relationship with God, he will work in our lives in ways that we never dreamed possible. <clears throat> I want God to work through my life to break my fears, 
to break my limitations, to, bro to break the restrictions that I place on myself, to break the insecurities that I have within myself, and to challenge me and mould me in ways that I've never been moulded before. I want him to take me to new levels of spiritual potency. I want to be a person that's kinder than I've ever been before, more forgiving than I've ever been before. I want to have the best prayer life that I've ever had and I want God to do that for me. I want to be the most potent witness that I can possibly be in my community. And God can help me do that. He can work through me and empower me to do that. I want to have the courage to invite my friends to Jared's program, even though it's half finished. I want to still take those risks to look a little bit silly, to put my cool identity on the line and maybe cloud it a little bit with some spiritual weirdness and make an offer to someone that might give them an eternal life outcome. I want to see that for what it is and, and be willing to take that risk. I want to plant seeds in my life and in those around me in ways that people can water later. I want to be an agent for God that can plant a seed in someone's life. It may not hatch now, but I want to plant lots of seeds with God's power and have his Holy Spirit do the work to water them. Not because I want to be seen to be an amazing disciple, but because God's called me to do that. He hasn't just called me to do that, he's empowered me to do it. In all parts of my life, I want God's maths working for me. And I hope you do too. I pray that you might come into our hearts and into our life as a church and as individuals, that you might change us and empower us to be the potent kind of disciples and followers of you that you would have us be. Uh, we thank you for the promises we have in the Bible that teach us that you can give us the strength to do anything. We, we claim those promises, Lord, and as we leave this church today, we pray that we might make a difference in our lives and in the lives of uh, those around us as we uh, follow you. In your name, amen.